sorry. <laughs> Welcome to our um, discussion of researching in the Bodleian Library at, um, at Oxford. Um, each of us has published a book about Barbara Pym or has a chapter in one about Barbara Pym. So I'm going to introduce each of our panelists who, you know, none of them I think is a stranger to anyone in the Pym Society. But let's start with Yvonne, <clears throat> Yvonne Cocking. Uh, her book is Barbara in the Bodleian, Revelations from the Pym Archives, published in 2013. Laura Shapiro, uh, her book, What They Ate, Six Remarkable Women and the Food That Tells Their Stories, published in 2017, has a chapter devoted to the remarkable Barbara Pym. Paula Byrne has written the most recent biography of Barbara Pym, The Adventures of Miss Barbara Pym, published last year, 2021, as was Emily Stockard's book, The Making of Barbara Pym, Pym uh, Oxford, The War Years, and Postwar, Austerity, published well, both of them in 2021. I am Kathy Ackley, uh, and my book, The Novels of Barbara Pym, was published a long time ago, in 1989. Um, all of us have spent time doing research in the Pym archives at the Bodleian Library, and we're going to talk informally today in a kind of roundtable discussion. Um, the focus is on our experiences with those archives and on writing about Barbara Pym. So we'll begin by talking about, each of us talk about our book in general, what it does, and our research process especially. Um, Yvonne, could we start with you, please? Your book, Barbara in the Bodleian, is tailor-made for this conference session because it's all about your, well, the subtitle, Revelations from the PIM Archives. Would you talk to us about your book and your research um, method especially, because you spent a lot of time in the Bodleian Library. Well, Kathy, uh, unlike the rest of us here, I never set out to write a book. This was Tom's idea. He wanted something a bit special to mark the uh, centenary of Barbara's death. And as I had already written papers on the evolution of several of her novels, he thought that would make a, a good basis for a book. He asked me to write chapters on the two novels that I hadn't previously dealt with, so that each of the novels published in Barbara's lifetime were represented. I added an epilogue, and that was all I had to do. Tom added the preliminaries. Kathy and Christine Shuttleworth did the proofreading, Hazel Bell the index, and Lloyd the graphics. What a team. How lucky I was, was to have had such support. Now, Barbara's papers uh, <clears throat> are arranged in four main sections, uh, literary papers and notebooks, diaries, correspondence, and the catch-all heading miscellaneous. In the first category are drafts of sections and revisions of each book, some typed, but um, mainly in her own hand. Even Barbara's pre-war version of Some Tame Gazelle found in two volumes is there. The notebooks, so there I was able to turn immediately to uh, the sections on the particular uh, novel that I was going to talk about, but very easy. The notebooks were provided less formal, but nevertheless interesting materi materials, consisting of snippets of conversations overheard and situations observed, idiosyncrasies noted, anything that she thought might come in useful for her future work. As for example, her seat, sitting on the top of a bus and seeing a clergyman and a woman sitting in the, in the in a park holding hands. This sneaky found its way into excellent women. Uh, letters from her friends and her publishers also cast light on, uh, on her activity. So I, I think that's uh, all I can say about that. Uh, is, uh, something. Okay. No, that's, that's very good. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Laura, your book was published next in chronological, well, except mine, but anyhow, <laughs> after Yvonne's. 
<laughs> would you tell us about your project and your research on PIM? You know, my project, and I think uh, everyone else here will understand when I say it all starts with Yvonne. She was the leader into those archives. Certainly for me, when I first, uh, I've been working on this book a thousand years, when I first went into the archives or had the idea of doing this incredibly uh, scary thing, probably 10 or 12 years ago, I was in touch with Yvonne, who kindly came over and met me there at the Bodleian, where I saw her approach in person, which was, I was saying, well, don't you have to fill out this form and put this and ask for that? She said, I don't do any of that. She said, they just give me these things. So she was so at home and it just, and she could read the handwriting. So this, yeah. she was the best guide to have in that. And it made all my Barbara Pym research year after year, that made it all possible was, was Yvonne's leadership. What I uh, write about is food. So that's what I'm always looking for. And my book was about uh, looking at the lives of six women through their relationships with food. And of course, you know, what is Barbara Pym, but a food writer who just kind of never got around to recognizing that fact. So I knew, uh, I knew when I got in there, there, there would be a lot of food. And of course I had read uh, a lot to ask. So I had a little sense of what would be there. So I went into the notebooks and I just, I, I remember this moment. I remember this moment at the table. This is in the pre-rebuilding uh, the Goblin the place where this, uh, she, in, in 1948, she writes, she writes uh, a, fresh, a fresh salad and then she scratches it out and puts lettuce. And I knew that that would be there. And that was one of the key things I was looking for. And there it was in her handwriting, which Yvonne helped me to read. It was just transporting to see that uh, <laughs> all, what I wanted from Barbara Pym, this whole uh, exuding of the information and the emotions around food, it was all going to be there. So it was, it was bliss. Every single moment in that archive was bliss. And uh, I'd go back this afternoon if I could get on a plane. Uh, would, you, would you tell us about your, well, your book, of course, the biography, but your research, you did extensive research. Yeah, I, I, again, like Laura, um, we're all following in Yvonne's footsteps, aren't we? And, and probably never going to do it as well as Yvonne. Um, but um, I, I um, yeah, I, I was lucky, and I suppose this is the modern age for good or for bad, um, for being the beneficiary of the digital age. So um, the Bodleian allowed, you know, I, I know Yvonne has spent thousands and thousands of hours in that dimly lit manuscript room, and that would test the nerves of the most fastidious scholar, because it's never easy in those conditions when you, when, also, it's such a daunting archive. It's so large. So, uh, you know, Yvonne was amazing and, and, and sensibly would do it bits at a time because, you know, you'd go mad, wouldn't you? Let's face it, if you're in, the, in there for any, you know, if you're there for like eight weeks, 10 weeks to, a year. So I asked if I could photograph everything on my trusty phone. Um, and to my surprise, because it, it, traditionally archivists don't really like that. Um, and they said, you know, it's absolutely fine. And their feeling was that nowadays, um, it's better to let somebody photograph everything in some respects, because you don't put your fingers all over it. Right. It, it. It helps to preserve the archive. But I lived in Oxford, so it was easy for, you know, I lived there. So it was like a five second walk to go and go to the library. But halfway through, I moved to America. So I put a lot on my phone. And the, for me, the advantage of that, and, and you, Laura talked about, the difficulties of reading handwriting and we're lucky actually because Barbara's hand is pretty good mm -hmm. I think compared to some <laughs> that I've read over the years um and it's just a matter of getting used to it the hand isn't it you you start seeing the l's and the m's and you see all of that but because I had it on my phone I was able to scroll in so if there was a tricky letter that might take me an hour because I'm tired and the room's poorly lit and you want a cup of tea um and I was just able to do a lot from home, but then to also check everything 
did I get that right? Um, so I really feel like I was the beneficiary of, 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 of modern technology and the kindness of the Bodleian um, and, and the helpful staff for whom they could never do enough to help you. We, did, we all probably had that experience, I suppose. Right, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm. Oh, thank you, Paul. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think we're all nodding. And yes, <laughs> yeah, they were um, wonderfully helpful. Um, I'll, so Emily, I'll ask you next, and then I'll talk about my own experience there as well. Oh, well, when I went, um, I did have a plan. I mean, I knew I wanted to write a book uh, and what I have published is really only half of what I've written. Um, and so I was working, I knew I was working on a school, on a, you know, on a big scale, but of course I knew, I knew Hazel's, bold, uh, Hazel's book really well. I knew Very Private Eye, I knew Yvonne's book. So I knew what had been published and I was hoping that I could sort of discover things. And I, of course I knew Laura was working on food so I wouldn't have to think about food. Um, but I was hoping I would find something that hadn't been published yet. Um, and I sort of thought, well, I don't exactly know what I'm looking for but I'll know it when I saw it. I'll know it when I see it. Um, and I also knew that my focus was going to be literary and that I would really want to look at the notebooks and the drafts first. Uh, and I did fill out all the little pieces of paper and submitted <laughs> them. Um, but before I went, I contacted Laura uh, and just said, oh, what do I do? And so, you know, she wrote me a very um, <laughs> peaceful letter. This is, this is it, don't worry, it's gonna work out. Um, and like her, of course, you know, it was, it was thrilling uh, and I did work. Um, very intensely, I knew my time was limited. Uh, and while I knew what I wanted to look at, um, as you all are all saying, um, it's addictive and you want to look at everything, uh, whether you have time to or not, you wanna look at everything because there it is right there. Uh, it's a real temptation. But for me, it was such an intensive, immersive experience. I mean, I went in there at nine o'clock in the morning. As soon as I could get there, I had my favorite chair. I wanted to make sure I got that chair. Um, I had my, my pieces of paper filled out. And yeah, I mean, the humanity of that place, you felt like you, well, you were, you were working with real people. Um, they do anything for you. I said, I can't find this. They turned the place upside down and found it. And I said, well, I don't really need it. And I said, no, we're going to find it. And I thought, okay, do it. And then it turned out I really did need it. So, um, no, they couldn't have been more helpful. Um, and, um, and I was able to uh, really do a lot more than I thought I was going to be able to, um, partly because of, you know, their help. Uh, and then like Paula, I, I did, I, they, they allowed me to take... <clears throat> I didn't have an iPhone, but they did allow me to take um, take photographs. Um, but again, I had to take it at such a breakneck speed. Um, I mean, it was just hell for leather. <laughs> I was um, I was just totally immersed. And honestly, I don't know how long I could have kept up that speed because I would stay until seven and maybe take a little bit of lunch. But again, it was never hard. It was never tedious. Um, <laughs> It was always just so exciting. What's going to be there when I open up the next box? Because even though they are labeled carefully, you never know what's going to be there. And that was, you know, that was the fun. Just what, what, what am I going to find? Uh, and I did, um, you know, I did find things. I know we'll talk about this later, but yeah, I, I did find things that I, I couldn't have anticipated. Excellent. Yeah, well, I, mine was well before any of you. <laughs> um, and I, so there weren't too many predecessors. And um, yeah. I had read um, the, the autobiography and diary and letter, diaries and letters that was out in 84. And Jane Arden had written a book and there were several other books, you know, that had been published, but I was kind of 
on my own. But, you know, it was my first sabbatical and I was so excited about Barbara Pym. Um, um, my favorite, I did my dissertation on George Eliot. My favorite book was the novels of George Eliot. So I thought, huh, the novels of Barbara Pym, <laughs> why not? And, and I just, you know, I just planned to do a, a literary study, just talk, look for themes actually in, in the books and, and that's what I had planned to do. But, uh, you know, it was, I needed to see the, the archives. I, like you, I got there as soon as I could in the morning and I stayed all day. Uh, it was in February of 1988, so there weren't a lot of tourists around, and it was kind of, you know, the streets were a little bit empty, <clears throat> and it was just also, as you say, most of you, you know, it, it was just kind of magical being in the Bodleian Library from having to write the Western, of, you know, the director of uh, manus Western manuscripts and Hazel Holt to get permission. I still have those letters, <laughs> and uh, you know, and all my little notes in pencil. Of course, you couldn't use pen uh, and ink, and um, you know, I didn't mind that that little room at all, Paula. <laughs> Paula, I just, um, I just really the whole thing for me was like, I'm a scholar. <laughs> And this, you know, I'm at Oxford. And um, so, um, and, and I had just, as I said, just decided I was going to do a, 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 my own study of themes in the novels. And the, the archives were background material. And I did quote from some of them, but not nearly as heavily as, as the rest of you have done in your, in your books. So, yeah, it was, it was really, and, and I was trying to remember the name of the, the gentleman in the room, and I think it was Colin something, but I couldn't think of his, was it Colin? Colin, Colin Harris. I couldn't okay. think of his uh, name. He was wonderful. He just delightful, you know. So everyone just, uh, you know, it, it was a great experience, really. Um, even, even reading, you know, getting the, the reader's pass, I'm sure you all had to do it, where you had to promise not to, not to kindle fires <laughs> or bring fire in. Yeah. It was wonderful. I got I got I just have to say, since you bring up the oath, that was, I thought when the lady across the desk gave me that to read aloud, I thought, you know, up until now, I always thought the greatest moment in my life was when I gave birth to my daughter. I thought, but this is right up there. <laughs> <laughs> to, re to read those words. And she apologized. I'm so sorry, I have to give you this. Apologize, I said. This is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I have copies of that on bookmarks and tote bags. <laughs> you know, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> it was it was quite an experience for sure. Um, you mentioned Emily surprises, or you'd come across something you hadn't expected mm. to find. Could we let's talk about that yeah. next? And I um some little things and big things. Um, thinking back, I really loved seeing her full manuscripts of the early of the of the wartime, like mm -hmm. So Very Secret and Homefront Novel, and I was just so surprised. I was glad that I knew those from the edited from the edited version because I, I thought, well, good heavens, there's so much more here, and I understand how why Hazel had to edit the way she did, but it's a real treat to see those full things, and I tried to do justice a little bit in my book to what she, I thought she was trying to do. Um, I mean, my book is all about change, and of course, the making. <laughs> Um, and so the war is, and the war years are, were really important for me. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed seeing those full manuscripts. Um, and then, um, you know, much smaller things um, like, uh, like the, the cards that Daniel George sent her. Um, he had sent these cards with um, his own captions written in like, how the hell do I know when Barbara Lynette's book is coming out? You know, two men yakking at each other, just little things like that. Um, and I was surprised at all the different kinds of diaries. I mean, we all know the famous notebooks, but then to see those little date books um, and they came in this 
um, well, everything in the bottle and comes to you in this brown, you know, dull wrapper, and then you open it. And, oh, look at all these little tiny diaries! It's like a little Easter eggs or something that you that you found, and they were so little. And um, but they were just crammed, and so you know, in the published material, there's not a sense that she's working in all these different forms, in all these different types of diaries. Uh, and just how efficiently she could put so much information, especially during the war years, and when she was just going a mile a minute every day was just, I did this and this and this and this and this. Um, so that was, those were nice finds. Um, and then um, uh, later on, seeing the backstories that she'd written for Marcia and Letty and how, for Quartet and Automata, she just never stopped. She just kept working to hone her craft, letter notes to herself. Um, why do I need all this trivial detail? Why, just the creative process that you could see going on. I loved running across things like that. Um, and, you know, little tidbits. I can understand why you, they can't be part of a book. Although I did, but I did, I'm trying to make them part of a book, but I can see why they have to get left out, but yet they're so, they're so fun to find and interesting to find. Sure. Anyone else have that kind of experience? Well, I, um, I think it, I liked finding the poems. <clears throat> oh, wherever I was never looking for poems, but wherever I, I was, I was, found a poem. So I started searching for them and found about 36. And these were written by Barbara herself, uh, by uh, Jock Little, who was extremely good at it in a rather was waspish way. And, um, all the boyfriends uh, wrote, wrote one, I think. Uh, Rupert did. And so did um, uh, Skipper. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, I don't know whether this happens in universities these days, but it seemed to be a thing then uh, to write poems, mainly in um, rhyming couplets, which is an easy-ish form to write, use. But there's, they are very witty in many cases, especially littles, but as I say, they were a bit, a bit horrid writing about uh, people who had died, not very uh, politely. Uh, so yes, I, I like that, and I was able to um, make that uh, into one of my uh, lectures and have different people reading reading the different uh, right yeah. different poems. That was great. Of course. Well, related to the question of surprises, um, and, and I suppose it's just a different way of asking the same question. But did you have? Um, come across any information that you felt absolutely that this was extra level of enjoyment, that it was an aha moment. I'm, you're, you, you found this nugget. Um, I, Laura, you're, you're shaking your head. I'm thinking about- well, I think we're finding, we're finding the nuggets all the time, really. Well, that's true. Yes, yeah. no, it is. And certainly, uh, because I write about food, and I'm always looking for food in every archive of every person, and time and again, they don't write about it. It's everybody in their journals and their letters, they write about the weather, they'll write about what they were wearing. Everything is in there, but not food. So you get to Barbara Pym, and not only is she jotting down the things that she sees people eating or that she herself is eating, but, uh, but because of the context in your you're, you're finding these nuggets in this literary context. So it becomes so enlightening to see how these things get moved and shaped into the novels. And you can sort of see it. So it's, they start in the notebooks, but before that they start in her. It's she, those nuggets are her. You are actually finding her in that archive, which is the, the most kind of wonderful thing. She saved everything. So she knew, and then she herself wanted to give it to the Bothian. So she knew everything was gonna go. And yet it was so revealing. It's like, did she throw out anything? I, it's no. to our joy and, and to my amazement. Uh, there's, 
there's so much in there. One of the, but there was an aha moment that, that wasn't uh, so much about the food. We've, we've all probably seen the first draft of uh, Some Tame Gazelle that's full of the Nazis. Oh, yes. And that's a whole kind of episode in Barbara's life that can be dealt with. To, to me, the other fascinating thing about that draft was, and this is the first novel she actually finished and sent to a publisher, it was terrible. So you're seeing Barbara Pym, the world's most careful uh, stylist the, the, who manicured that style. Every word, every punctuation mark is perfect in her other books. Here in this first draft, it's terrible. So, so uh, and, the, and the Nazis are just kind of the outward sign of the fact that something is really wrong with the writing. Then you see in the notebooks, the editing process that she went to, how she was able to get rid of not only the Nazis, but everything else extraneous in that draft. Things got narrowed, things got more beautifully shaped. She zeroed in on character. She, she knew what she was doing. Her own wonderful, inimitable sense of humor crept up and, and made itself known. She did all that with her own self-editing. I mean, she had the help from uh, Jock, but she did it herself. And to me, that, that second draft shows the making of Barbara Pym. That's where you see her. It's interesting though, isn't it? That she didn't throw it away because, you know, we, we talk about she kept every scrap of paper, every idea just in case. And it is shocking when you first read it with the benefit of hindsight and knowing Nazis with the legacy of the Nazis, which Barbara didn't have when she was first writing it um, and, and just putting all that aside. But what struck me, and this is the wonderful thing about being in an archive is you actually smell, touch, feel the, the stuff in front of you. So when you see that beautifully bound manuscript, she bothered binding it and she bothered keeping it. And, and you just sort of go, well, what's going on there? Like, because she's proud of it, because she wants people like Laura and Emily and Yvonne and me and Kathy to say, oh, but we're going to see the creative process, or we're going to see the we're going to see how she honed her craft. We're going to see how she started, how she ended. It always puzzles me as much of what people don't destroy as to what they do destroy. And, and I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I've got I, something I'd like Yvonne to talk about, and that's um, though those notebooks, and you gave a talk about it, where she's recording the goings and comings of her neighbors. Can you remember running across that? Because <laughs> I, I came to a conference and I, I had never met you, and I said, you can't believe it what I just found and I started oh. talking about it and you said don't don't talk about it that's what I'm writing about <laughs> okay because oh, that was surprising it was it uh, yes I could never understand how a girl of her education and intelligence could spend her life so vicariously living living through other people's experiences right. yeah Incredible. yeah yeah. It, it was it's certainly an insight into a sort of an obsessive side of her. Right. Because it was. But, you know, when you think about it, every writer must be obsessive to some degree. And then when I think about myself, well, what am I doing? Now, I'm sitting in this Bodleian hour after hour after hour after <laughs> hour after hour after day after day, going through somebody's life, which is what I was doing yeah. in a very detailed way. So, you know. I sort yeah. of give her a break <laughs> because right. I can see I'm kind of doing a similar thing. Uh, well, um, did, did that change your perception of her? I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, did, did doing, did reading every, all that information about Barbara Pym and the archives, did it change any preconception you had had or, or any idea you had in mind? Uh, this is for, for all of us, but Emily, did you want to carry on with that? I, you're, you're nodding there. Well, I think most of what I saw kind of reinforced what I already okay. thought. Maybe, uh, I hate to think that I was so, you know, <laughs> my ideas were so preconceived, but 
the things that I ran across, I had a place for them. I, I could, okay. I could, I could see them as part of what um, I had thought of her. I mean, uh, one thing, and this is in a uh, very private eye where, um, or it's in one of the, one of the books, Hazel's books, um, Liddell says jokingly, why don't you come and write a thesis on Rochester? But she actually was very interested in him. And I'm not sure how much of a joke that really was because in her notebooks, there are um, the, the beginnings like collections of titles and in her library, she had um, um, a later biography by Graham Greene of Rochester. Okay. Uh, so little things like that sort of all started coalescing more sure. um, is what I found. Okay. Um, Paula, I know you have talked about how there was a, a preconception, not yours in particular, but you had heard certain things about what kind of person Barbara Pym was so that it was kind of a revelation for you to read her materials. Is that is that right? Does that sound? Yeah, I, it's such a great question, Kathy, because I think I probably had the opposite experience of Emily because uh, she did surprise me. And I, what I love about Barbara Pym, and you all know I came to her relatively late, and it was such a joy because not only because the quality of the writing's so good, but she's just very, very funny. And I think it's very hard to be funny in, in paper, uh, 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 on the paper. It's, it's just so hard to be funny. And people underestimate this. They think, oh, it's, it's comedy or it's so, it's so it's easy. It's really difficult to make people laugh. And I always laughed out loud with Barbara. I always thought she was just so funny. But I think when, and, and I think one of the things I did very early on was I listened to her Desert Island Discs um, recording and then working through the archive, the thing that really stopped me in my tracks was just how deeply romantic she was. And I should have known that from Desert Island Discs. You know, if you think about the choices that she made to Rose and Cavalier, Tosca and Arundel Tomb, you know, these are deeply romantic. But because I was so, I think I was so seduced by her, her wit that I didn't see the beating heart underneath. And then when I just saw how deeply she felt things and how painful she found the breakup of relationships and how much, and this, I think her obsessive nature plays into this, you know, the way she chased Henry Harvey around Oxford and the way, the way she fell in love with Denton Wall, she was dead and gay. It's like, that's the ultimate, you know, unavailable man. And she was obsessive about Denton Walsh. So the point of let's have picnics where we eat the same food, <laughs> but it's a sort of, um, <laughs> So, so, so she came across to me as somebody, I think, more deeply sensitive and easily hurt than I'd anticipated. Okay. Yeah, Laura? It's yeah, no, it's, it's interesting what you're saying because you discovered this whole kind of passionate, vulnerable self, uh, you know, under the comedy, under, under, under the written word, and, and it's also under the, um, oh, you know, the critical, the traditional critical perception of Barbara Pym. Oh, she's this spinster. These are novels about boiled eggs. You know, it's, it's okay if you like that kind of thing. And, you know, for a long time, that's kind of how she was categorized. It's like nobody could take seriously the prose, which is so exquisite and so perfect. And you couldn't take it seriously because it's about you know church bazaars and uh, and tea cozies and and therefore it couldn't be important and it wasn't until she started to get recognized later on that critics took her seriously but even then they couldn't take the pim we know seriously they had to turn her into a tragic figure you know oh these books they're so full of pathos they're they, you know you're just uh, they're sort of heartrending these pathetic spinsters Every one almost of these pathetic spinsters has a guy waiting off stage who is going to marry her after the last chapter. It's right there. She loved the marriage plot. That's what she was writing. So, but, but these critics who want to turn her into a, a tragic figure and the books into these emblems of the, you know, the barren empire and all that stuff, 
just to be able to take it seriously. Her actual contribution, her actual work seemed to be impossible for them to, to take it. Yeah. For well, except, I think except that, you know, she does talk, she does write brilliantly about loneliness and she does write brilliantly about heartbreak and she does write brilliantly about thwarted relationships where you might fall in love with a gay man who can never reciprocate. I think, you know, all those things are there, but the, the wonderful thing, she leavens it all. So often her works are quite bittersweet, I find. Like, I, I sometimes find myself moved to tears by some, of, I mean, I think a sweet, The Sweet Dove Died, um, Leonora's plight, there were times when she just writes so brilliantly about what it's like to the aging process of you're a beautiful woman and, yes. and loneliness. And I think all of the, I think as she went on writing and did become, I'm not gonna say bitter, but life had, um, she, she'd had some, some sad experiences. I think all of those things are reflected in her, in her writing. And I think she's a better writer for, you can't keep writing about, um, you know, lovely spinster sisters and the curate coming and oops you know I'm in my underwear all your life you know and, and they're lovely and, and joyous but what I think I love about her is that there's a real sense of, of an author who develops and grows and reflects and I always get frustrated Laura when people say oh you know she never she didn't reflect the, the changes and I'm like are we actually reading the same books are you actually are you right. kidding me Do, she writes about the 60s she writes about single women who have a rich inner life. They're not necessarily waiting for a man in the background because they have a, Mildred has a rich inner life. And Mildred looks with a very clear eye on people who are married and thinks, I don't want that. Exactly. And so I think there's, there's so many nuances in Pym. And, and I think you're absolutely right, Laura, that it, it really frustrates me when people say, oh, she's all cozy, you know, tea cozies and, and, and you know, um, caterpillars and salads. And you just go, well, no there's so much more and maybe you just need to be more sensitive readers or maybe you need to reread because if you reread Pim you're going to get so much joy I mean sorry to have a rant here but it does you know <laughs> well, it's, it's I don't really know if you hard. agree or disagree feel just feel free to disagree but no, don't. it's hard to write about how good she is that's the problem I mean as a I I feel like, you know, in my book, I did, I could not do her sense of humor justice because it's so hard to talk about humor. Yeah. So hard. And the best I could do was quote the funny parts. I think because once you try, start trying to explain the jokes, forget it. I mean, you either get it or you don't. And for people who don't get it, I'm not sure there's much you can do about it. But, you know, but when you do look at the archive, you clearly see you can clearly see that development and how much she is working towards that. Even when she wasn't being published, she was still telling herself, I need to improve in this way. Um, look at what Virginia Woolf talks about the tedium of modern fiction and how to make it more poetic. I mean, she was still to the end, she was working on that, um, that craft. And um, it's just, it's just so hard to account for it. Um, I, I, I think it, it's hard to, it's hard to, to, to explain to someone yeah. the different levels in, in PIM. You almost have to just, I think, I just can't even, I can't even go there. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard for everyone. Yeah. You just have to get it when you read it. Exactly. Yeah. The proof's in the pudding. You, you have to, it's, it's right there. And if you don't see it, I can't show it to you. <laughs> now, Kath, Kathy, because you were doing your work before so many other people, I, I, you must have made discoveries that you had no context for. You were just finding stuff out. Nobody. I was just finding stuff that. out. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And, um, I, you know, I was so young. I was... <laughs> I did. I was not an experienced writer or researcher, and um, I don't really. I'm mean, joking about the young part, but anyhow, it's true that I, I really hadn't written a lot before I decided I'm going to write a book, and I was simultaneously working on a, a college composition textbook, which was nothing like writing about Barbara Pym. So everything that I read was just material that I just soaked up 
as I discussed the novels, the, the theme, thematic, various themes in the novels, like male-female relationships and the company of women and uh, infinite possibilities. Um, and all this reading, you know, the literature, the importance of literature, and so on. So it was just a joy, yes, to, to, to just read all of that material. And, you know, what, what, a, what a mind, you know, lovely um, bit of just, uh, yes, it, it was. It, it was um, all very, very, um, I, I just didn't know what to do with it because I had in mind I was going to do one thing and I just soaked it up. And that's why I've enjoyed so many of the, so many novels and I mean, books, critical studies that have come out since then. And I remember um, that first time I went to Oxford to use the PIM archives, um, I was, uh, I wrote a course to Hillary um, Walton PIM and um, she said, why don't we meet for lunch? And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, yes, of course, that would be wonderful. And so she, she collected me at the, in the Western Manuscripts room and she opened the door and I thought, well, that's Harriet Bede, you know, it's, uh, it's not Hillary. And uh, she, she was just sort of the stereotype. She was exactly like, you know, a fictional character, but in the flesh. And, and uh, we, we just relaxed and had a lovely lunch. And, you know, she said, what would you like to know? And I said, everything um i you know what do you want to share what do you want to tell me and she she just was so um i don't know it was just it was just all part of that uh collecting sort of the feeling of barbara pym and 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 just reinf i mean i'd already met her in the novels and i loved her and 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 i you know that even following um Henry around Oxford, I, I would stand on a certain street where she looked at him and said, she was here. <laughs> you know, just kind of silly, silly things, but just, um, yeah, it, it was, it was interesting to, to be an early one. And, and Hazel Holt commented on that too. She said, you were one of the early ones, weren't you? And, yes, I was. <laughs> So, Yvonne, you're, you're, do you have anything to add here? You were nodding. I, I think, um, what was the question? Was it, um, uh, did your research in any way change your perception? Yes, Pick, well, that's great, yes. Unlike all you ladies with great critical faculties, I'd, I'd, I would just like to say the one thing that all I knew before um, starting research in the library on the novels was a superficial knowledge of the author herself. Um, so to learn about her early life was quite a revelation. I found it difficult to reconcile the outgoing flirtatious undergraduate with a seemingly shy, rather reserved mm -hmm. editor of Africa. Yeah. It was amazing how she seemed to change completely. Yeah. yeah. I think that's one of the key questions, and I'm not sure I've cracked it either. I mean, I, my book, or two books, I hope, um, sort of are, you know, trying to track a trajectory in her life and her work as they you know, are interwoven. But that shift that you're talking about, uh, and I think I've talked to some people about that in the PIM conference, you know, informally, it's hard to date uh, unless it's got to do with her time in the Wrens um, and, and Gordon Glover. I mean, they're, they're I think, there I think all, that was the- A, a real point, turn, a really. little fulcrum yeah. there. Yeah. And That's for the I'm better thinking. in a way, but still. And she even said it, the foot less prompt to meet the morning dew or whatever line she quoted. And I think that line might be more important than maybe we given it credit for. Or of course it changed everybody. Yeah. Uh, she had such a different life after the war. Her, her father used to support her in the past, but he, his, her mother had died. And she was out in the world on her own without any real qualifications uh, for a job. And she seemed to change from that point. Her, she, uh, she no, no longer was this outgoing person. She seemed to 
in the wasn't, so. wasn't that about I, I always think of that turnaround moment back from the war she moves into the flat in Pimlico she decides to be a writer she she's kind of felt like maybe she was a writer now she really decides that this is going to be it and yeah. I feel as though everything flows from that moment that um She's not, she doesn't, you know, sit there daydreaming about getting married or something. I, I think she, all that stuff, just, there were, there were going to be tragic love affairs well coming on, but, but, but it wasn't, she knew they were semi-fantasies, that despite the fact that she was racked and ruined by them. I, it, it was about writing. It was about being a writer. That's what she wanted to do. Miss Pym, the novelist, that's what she wanted. I feel as though everything went in that direction. And I remember, I hope I'm remembering this right at the centenary conference in Britain where we went to the church, her church in where she's buried in the, in the churchyard. As it happens, there was kind of a vogue in that churchyard for, for the most loquacious gravestones. Everybody's got poetry and quotes from this and that and it's they all and it's all kind of the same obviously they were all getting the same stuff but hers has one word it says writer I feel like that's what she wanted to end up as right yeah good point yeah um the, so the we'll, we'll end with this question um is there a part of your book that you're secretly proud of or that you most enjoyed writing and what I was saying is the, my chapter on literature because I just thought man that's so good when I got done you know but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that publicly to anybody but I, I really thought it was well done and I so enjoyed writing that particular chapter any of the rest of you have um, you know you're like you're secretly proud especially of something in your book you know, no. when I got to, when I got to the end of her life, and she's in the hospital, and uh, she she's ending, she she she's ending, and I I felt like I got to give her a little present at the end because I pulled in Virginia Woolf, I, and I I I said something about Virginia Woolf, and then I ended with a note about Barbara. I thought, okay, you can have that. You admired her so much. Here she is. That was a little gift. Excellent. Very good. No, nobody else. I mean, I, I, there wasn't a particular, I just thought it was such a privilege and honor to be in her company for so long. And even though my book was twice the length it was commissioned for, oh sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it, it was, it, it just, it felt so enjoyable. And, and she's probably one of the only writers that I've written a biography of that I, I loved as much when I got to the end of it as I loved her from the beginning. And I still wanted to go back to the novels, which I've done since. And often you don't want to do that. You spent, you know, all those years and you think, oh, you know, forget it. And I, I didn't feel like that. I, I just thought, gosh, she was great fun. And I did feel quite bereft. I felt like I missed her in my life, you know, because she just, for a long time, you know, she was a huge, huge part of my life, what, writing about her. And she was just enormously good company. So right. I, it, there wasn't a, not a particular moment, but the whole experience for me was, was felt very positive. Okay, fair point. Yeah, good. <laughs> no? Any last I like little, um, thoughts? I like the little things I could sneak in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which I tried to sneak little things in. Like I found a, um, a little newspaper clipping um, that told of um, Julian Amory's mother taking the wrong train. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's that bit in Crampton Hodnett about where Simon says, I hope my mother knows how to get here. <laughs> Who knows which came first? But, but the fact that she took that little clipping and pasted it on the front of something. Yeah. I mean, I liked being able to find little things and find a way to squirrel them into the book, whether they really needed to go there or not. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that seemed a very pimish thing to do in a way to kind of have an, a joke, an in-joke in, in, oh, yeah, in the book. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, was, that was such a funny little clipping and it was told in a comical way. And she loved that, obviously, and, and, you know, and kept it. Any, any final thoughts about your experience with Barb Pym and the archives? No? You, you did mention that, that you might ask uh, our uh, 
uh, fondest memories of working yes. in. Oh, yes. I and missed uh, that. Without any doubt in my mind, it is room 1132. Ah, yes, absolutely. Now, that was the home of uh, modern manuscripts in the old New Orleans, you know. And um, in the busy, yes, it was overseen by Colin Harris, as you say, who he was much lauded by everybody who met him for his invaluable assistance. Yeah. Remember him, don't you, Kathy? And, and Laura, do you remember Colin? Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, but he, he had only one voice level, and that was loud. <laughs> Whether he was speaking to a, a library user or speaking on the telephone, the whole room could hear, hear what he was saying. And I thought that was rather a peccadillo for a librarian to do that. Um, Hazel Holt used the room 132 and the little adjoining uh, cupboard uh, for her novel, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, April, The Cruelest Month. Oh, yes. It was a Mrs. Um, the first one. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it, when you read that, you can see that room right. and, and the little, little room opposite. I loved it. So sorry when we moved from there. Oh. It was so friendly and that informal somehow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, room 132. I, I actually thought that was the number. I'm glad you confirmed it. I couldn't, I was looking for it in my notes. I thought room 132 Western manuscripts, Colin, somebody. And so now I know Colin Harris, room 132. All right, any, any final comment from anybody else? That was lovely, Yvonne. I just wanna thank you for giving us this chance to go back to those archives and remember it. Even after I had finished the book, actually, after I had turned in the manuscript, I kept thinking, you know, am I completely sure I got that quote right? I think it was a semicolon, and I would yeah. rush back right. <laughs> just to have one more little trip. So thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Yes, I, too, um, feel it was a great privilege for me, who not a writer, not an academic, uh, to gain access to that wonderful archive. Yeah. So great. Great. Well, thank you all. Emily? Well, I was going to say one thing that was enjoyable was seeing sometimes the green slips from previous people. Oh, uh, yes. And oh, you I ran across your green slips. I ran across yours with your name. And so, and Robin Joyce, I believe. I mean, you could see oh, sort nice. of the archives of the people who had looked at the archives. Yeah. So that was fun. But yeah. also, one of the things I found was a slip that uh, Rupert had filled out as if he were ordering Barbara, had her name, and then, so he filled out those slips as if he were, as if she were someone he was ordering from the Bodleian. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that was, <laughs> that was kind of meta. <laughs> <laughs> right, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my, my favorite memory of the Bodleian is, going in again and giving in the slip and, and the, the chap comes with the big cardboard box and he says, she's awfully popular, this Barbara Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes. Thank you all for participating in this discussion. It has been fun Just going down memory lane, <laughs> pretty far for some of us. And I do appreciate um, all of you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to see Thank everybody. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see everyone. Hope to